Sorry about that. Um, OK, so today I'm going to present uh, some recent work um, with my collaborators, Hori and Stephen from Berkeley, and my advisors, Ben and Mike, um, learning without mixing. So in the interest of time, let's just dive into the problem statement. Um, in this talk, I'm just going to focus on the problem of learning a linear dynamical system uh, from um, uh, observing its iterates. So our model is going to be that we have some matrix A in R D by D, and we're going to have two, uh, two processes, uh, a noise process and a, and a state process, and they're going to be related in the following way. Xt is just going to be linear in the previous uh, state, plus some driving noise. Uh, and the noise for this talk we'll just take to be normal 0, 1, and for simplicity we're just going to start the process at 0. Um, so the goal here, what we're going to try to do is we're going to try to show that the least squares estimator of A star, just by regressing the future covariates to the previous ones, is close to the ground truth um, in the operator norm with some high probability. And there are two main challenges that we need to overcome. So the first challenge uh, is that the noise and the covariates are going to be correlated across time. Even though the noise sequence is IID, uh, just this process introduces some serial correlation. And the second issue, um, and this is a bit more subtle, and we won't focus on it too much in the talk, but it is important, is that in our community, we like to think of matrices that satisfy the spectral theorem. In uh, the control community, that's not the case. So we want results that um, behave really well if A may be not uh, symmetric or perhaps not even diagonalizable. And uh, we can remark on that a little later. So yeah, here's the problem that we're going to look at. Uh, so prior to us, uh, people had studied this problem, but we found that there were kind of two things lacking in the source of results that existed so far. Um, so the first thing is that uh, the, rates, the rates that people attained, uh, they got worse with slower mixing. So I'm going to explain sort of later on what the intuition is for the mixing time in the system. But um, imagine that k-mix is just sort of how long you'd have to wait for two um, uh, uh, states to be essentially independent. Um, how independent they need to be kind of depends on that is super mild. But what you'd find is that rates would, uh, if you look at the squared error in the operator norm, um, the error would, would grow linearly in the mixing time. And um, it could even be worse for systems that don't mix. And the second issue is that this burn-in would degrade as you would mix more slowly. So precisely, the burden you can think of as the number of samples one would need before you can get non-vacuous results. And that would grow as a factor of invention times the mixing time. So in our work, what we do is we consider um, marginally stable uh, linear systems. Uh, so that's when the spectral radius of A star is less than or equal to 1. And what we show is the following three things. First, we're able to show that the least squares estimator, uh, the rates of estimation don't degrade uh, too heavily with slower mixing. The second thing is we're able to show that the burn-in times also don't degrade too significantly with slower mixing. And lastly, we actually uncover this interesting phenomena, which is that sometimes in those systems that mix more slowly, you actually have considerably faster rates. Um, so let's make these three things kind of quantitative. Uh, first here, we show that sort of in the worst case, you're going to get um, a O tilde square root D over T uh, estimation. Um, note that for the operator norm, this is sort of the right quantity that one would hope for. Um, the second thing is we're going to get O tilde uh, burn-in time. Uh, these O tildes are hiding factors that are potentially logarithmic in the dimension, logarithmic in the condition number of a diagonalizing matrix, and depend on the number and size of the Jordan blocks. Um, and finally, what we show is that uh, for certain classes of systems, in particular one example I'll show you later on, uh, that the rates actually can speed up linearly in the mixing time if you consider the square error. Or uh, you can, if, the, if the mixing time is very large, you end up with this fast rate regime which is even, which is even uh, better than this. So I think the way to explain the intuition for why mixing might, cap might be the wrong way to understand the sample complexity is to look at the Gramian, or the kind of covariance structure of these linear systems. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to define the finite time Gramian. It's just going to be the expectation of the outer product of the teeth covariate. Uh, you can see that as the Gramian kind of takes more and more excitations as time goes on, it's an increasing positive semi-definite matrix, and the first one is just going to be the identity. But the second thing is that the Gramian actually encapsulates how well or how quickly the system mixes. So more precisely, uh, the system mixes if and only if this Gramian, uh, which is a sort of a non-increasing, a non-decreasing sequence in the loner order, converges to some limit. Uh, and that's, in fact, one can show this is true if and only if the spectral radius of A is strictly less than 1. Uh, more precisely, the mixing time can be, can be related to the rate of decay between the, the infinite time limit of the Gramian and the teeth uh, iterate, or the teeth version of it. And for diagonalizable systems, in fact, you can have a really nice expression in terms of the spectral radius of A, 
where the mixing time grows uh, is in inversely proportional to the difference between the spectral radius and one. Note that for the marginally stable systems, uh, the mixing time is infinite. They don't, they don't actually have mixing. Um, but this kind of third important property of this Gramian is that it also kind of quite obviously approximates the covariance matrix. So what we find is that if you have a larger Gramian, intuitively you have larger covariates, and you should have more signal. You should have a higher SNR, because we're not changing the amount of noise that we're driving the process with, we're just driving, uh, changing the size of the covariates. And so intuitively, uh, you should actually expect to have faster learning rates if you have a larger Gramian, not slower ones, because even though larger Gramians may mix more slowly, um, they, uh, they provide you with more signal. So kind of the key technical step in all of this is what we, we, we adapt uh, Mendelssohn's small ball method uh, uh, for uh, kind of martingale processes. And we're able to show the following kind of PSD lower bound that uh, this should be kind of a, like a, a kind of curly uh, less than or equal to, uh, that the uh, covariance matrix is going to be dominated by T times the Gramian um, evaluated at about T over D, hiding some kind of lots of factors in here. Um, but what this allows us to do is it allows us to show that sort of the larger this Gramian is, and as it kind of grows over time and ultimately hits its limit, that gives us a nice lower bound on the covariance structure. Um, and that's, that's kind of the key technical tool to prove the results that I showed earlier on. So I kind of want to go into one really nice special case, which illustrates the kind of inverse relationship between mixing time and, um, uh, and learning rates. So what we're going to do is we're going to consider matrices which are just scaled orthogonal matrices where this is going to be some parameter in 0, 1. And I'm just going to give you an artist representation of the error uh, at some time t, which we'll fix as a function of the spectral radius parameter. So you, we find that we have two regimes, and they're kind of separated by this, uh, this spectral radius. One is where you have a linear speed up in the spectral radius, and then it kind of flattens off and gives you a fast rate. Um, over here, we don't actually know what happens, and we conjecture that least squares might be inconsistent, or at least we know experimentally that it's numerically unstable. But um, we find in the linear speed up, again, we have this improvement as rho approaches one, um, that should be a rho, uh, this speeds up. And then finally, in the fast rate regime, uh, we get a quadratic improvement. And note that this holds even up to one, so we are getting results for systems which don't obey mixing. And over here, the system is blowing up even more quickly. So this kind of encapsulates, again, uh, that mixing is, is actually the wrong way to analyze uh, these linear dynamical systems. We have just a couple more results just so I want to uh, list off before we finish. Um, we have near matching lower bounds uh, for that special case. We have very granular bounds for any matrix A star, which has a spectral radius that's strictly less than one. Uh, we can generalize things to other noise processes, non-identity non covariance structures, for example. Um, we can deal with control inputs if one would like, either with a known or unknown control matrix. And actually, our results are really don't have to do with linear dynamical systems at all. In fact, we can talk about arbitrary time series regression problems of the form uh, yt equals a star xt plus noise, where we just have some process with, a, with some mild assumptions, but we have a true linear model and some subgaussian noise. So everything, uh, all the principles previously, as long as x star satisfies kind of a generalization of this uh, small ball property, which uh, for martingales, we can prove lower bounds of this, we can prove uh, rates for systems of this form. So in summary, uh, you can learn without mixing or independent data. The ergodic theorem isn't necessarily the right way to get finite sample rates. Learning is about identifying uh, the sources of signal strength, and there's still many unresolved questions. So thank you. Questions? No questions. Okay. Well, let's thank the speaker again.